So first of all, I'd just like to thank Saab Miller for supporting and sponsoring this session. Smoke, eat, drink covers most things. Um, sex has been covered elsewhere, and drugs, I'm afraid, will have to wait till next year. Uh, but it's still a broad area to look at, and hence a, a diverse panel. So I've got uh, on my left Chris Snowden, who is a writer and blogger, a critic of the modern public health movement, and he's the author of Art of Suppression, which is a history of alcohol, narcotic, and tobacco prohibition since 1800. Sarah Jarvis is uh, also on my left, is a GP, author of Woman's Health for Life, and famously the TV doctor on BBC's The One Show. And after this session, she is off to Ipswich to give health awareness um, lectures to uh, truckers, or advice to truckers. So, well, well used to the glamorous uh, life, Sarah. On my right, Michael Nelson is a reader in uh, public health nutrition at King's College London, and he's been seconded to the school's food trust since 2006. And he's particularly interested in healthy eating in schools and writes widely on the subject. Next to him is Christine Thompson. Is, uh, she's the manager of UK government relations for brewing giant Saab Miller. And we, were, we have her to thank for all of the Peroni that uh, we managed to consume last night at the party. She was appointed director of the board of uh, the Westminster Forum, where her job is to keep business and Westminster talking. And Rob Lyons is, uh, has been writing on food and food panics for Spike for many years and is the author of Panic on a Plate, How Society Develops an Eating Disorder. And he's a fan of McDonald's and tries to visit them in every city, he, uh, in every country, I think, he goes to. So we've, uh, we've got booze and food well covered. And uh, I can tell you that I know three of us on the panel are smokers. So, uh, this session, where, uh, what we're looking at is both a, a current and um, an historical phenomena, as Chris has pointed out in his, in his book. Uh, it's got people with a desire to make things better having the opposite effect, as uh, Rob discusses in regard to Jamie's school dinners campaign um, and talks about widely in his book. It's got companies like Christine's uh, labelled as an evil empire. At the same time, we all love a microbrewery. Um, and booze in general, I think. Um, and it's turned GPs and scientists into experts that we go to, arguably, to make our personal choices for us. But uh, Michael and Sarah may, may disagree. So they've got five to seven minutes each um, to do their introductions. Chris, you're up first. It is, I'm, I'm sure, clear to everybody. Uh, you have to be uh, living under a rock not to notice that there is a uh, large and accelerating campaign against... Uh, tobacco, and uh, I'm sure you've also noticed that there's a growing campaign uh, against alcohol and against certain foods. Um, I suppose the, the question asked in this debate is, is this a prohibitionist crusade in, in the true sense of the word? Um, I mean, I've written about prohibitionist past and present. It seems to me that there are certain characteristics um, that, that, that cover these moral crusaders um, at any point in the last uh, two or three hundred years. I mean, firstly, they are generally not evil people. Um, they are usually actually very well-meaning people. Um, but they do suffer, I think, from an extreme form of self-righteousness. They find it difficult to um, appreciate other people's point of view or other people's lifestyle um, habits. Uh, they tend to have an excessive faith in the power of the state and the power of government to, uh, to perfect humankind, hence the prohibition has been the, the ultimate aim. Uh, they often m misrepresent and manipulate science and t statistics. They portray their crusade as being a war um, between downtrodden individuals and evil and avaricious industries. Uh, and the real giveaway, of course, is they have a penchant for banning things. And um, I think all of those characteristics are in evidence um, with uh, the public health crusade today. Certainly banning things seems to be the immediate uh, policy that is recommended, if not taxation, which is a, a, in a way a form of prohibition, as John Stuart Mill, Mill said. It's a, a prohibition for those who can no longer afford to, to buy the product in question. Now, for many years, the sort of libertarian argument, the libertarian predictions against and about the nanny state were that, A, the, the anti-smoking campaign in particular would lead to prohibition, and B, that... The, the same tactics used against smokers would be used against people who eat too much or drink fizzy drinks or, uh, or, or drink alcohol. Uh, it's a great shame, I think, that these 
predictions were not just ignored, but generally actually mocked and considered to be hysterical, because you know, who can deny that that, that is exactly um, what's happening? I mean, we, I do not exaggerate when I say that it's prohibitionist in the sense of, uh, it, for the tobacco people, um, in New, New Zealand has already stated its intention to eradicate tobacco use by the year 2025. Tasmania are talking about bringing in a law so that anybody who was born uh, after the year 2000 will not ever be able to buy tobacco, so effectively in a few years' time you'll have grown-ups grown who are prohibited from, from buying cigarettes. And, uh, and the word endgame is being used as a, as a euphemism in, in the academic literature um, for the tobacco control community. There isn't even an attempt now to deny that um, that is the ultimate goal at some point in the next 10, 15, uh, 20 years. In New, in New Zealand, some other people have said it's not really prohibition because you'll still be able to grow your own tobacco, but that's not really quite the same thing. Um, whether exactly this will go down exactly the same path with hamburgers and, uh, and wine and so on, is obviously a matter of, for speculation. Uh, I would just say that I think the onus now is on the campaigners to assure us of their good intentions, um, rather than for us to, to assume them, uh, particularly since you've got exactly the same institutions and the same personnel giving us the war on food and drink as gave us the war on smoking. Um, and if you ask me why they would keep on going and going and going until they at least attempt some form of prohibition, I would ask you why would they stop? Um, there's the great quote by C.S. Lewis about how it's better to live under robber bar barons than under moral busybodies, because a rob robber baron at some point has to sleep, at some point may feel some remorse, whereas the people who persecute us for our own good do so with the approval of their own conscience. Um, it's a case really of, of, of once bitten, twice shy. You know, in 2007, in my naivety, I thought the, the whole anti-smoking anti campaign might ground to a halt once non-smokers had the... In in, entire uh, indoors of the country to themselves. Quite obviously, I was wrong about this. Uh, what happened instead is that the government's total capitulation to the campaigners gave them added strength and, and efforts were redoubled. And I would suggest to you that anyone who thinks that plain packaging will uh, placate, placate the fanatics or that minimum pricing will appease the, the temperance lobby or that a tax on fizzy drinks will silence the British Medical Association simply does not understand the nature of the, um, of the moral crusader. I mentioned the, the misuse of science. So th certainly the prohibitionists in America um, used pseudoscience on, a, on an epic level. They said that alcohol turned the blood, blood to water, turned muscle to fat, a single shot of whiskey could kill, this kind of thing. That there was, uh, it's, uh, fundamentally, that there was no safe level of alcohol consumption, and it, it, alcohol could be addictive um, from the very first drop. Uh, but even at the time, academics in 19th century America did realize this was nonsense, and they did publish their findings looking at this. It, it, it was known, it was, just, it was just simply ignored. Now, we'd like to think that we have progressed a bit since then, um, and yet it's possible, as happened this week, for someone to go onto Newsnight and, uh, and say that sugar is literally toxic. Uh, something you, you have to have no understanding of, of what toxicity means to say this. Hundreds of newspapers around the world have reported that smoking bans instantaneously reduce the heart attack rate by 30, 40, 50 percent, which is not only biologically absurd but mathematically impossible. There seem to be people, many people, who believe that just walking past a pub, uh, which has people smoking outside, um, is, is hazardous, hazardous to their health. And these hypochondriacs today um, can be supported not by some placard-waving Baptist, but by the words of the US Surgeon General, by the Britain's Chief Medical Officer, and by peer-reviewed journals uh, from around the world. And we know, I think, that we've come full circle when you, you see a senior public health spokesman, as I did at uh, a party conference last week, stand up and say, literally, there is no safe level of, of alcohol, and uh, that there is no medicinal benefits from, from drinking alcohol, despite a, a, mountain of, a mountain of evidence to the contrary. And just finally, it takes, it, I, I take no pleasure at all in, in having been right when I was one of the hysterical libertarians warning what would happen. Uh, far from it, I would have happily been proven wrong. The cruelest part of it all is that um, all the time you, you predict these outcomes, you secretly think, well, when, when it happens, when it's not just the smokers, when it's the drinkers and the people who eat food, surely there'll be some sort of majority here, which, and then you know, some sort of backlash against the whole thing that'll bring it crashing to the ground. And yet what happens is, you know, people who seem perfectly sensible five, ten years ago suddenly start saying, well, you know, maybe fast food is addictive. Maybe, you know, sugar is toxic. And, you know, I don't mind people drinking, but this is binge drinking. You know, this is, it's an epidemic. It's not like drunkenness uh, like when, when we were younger. 
And uh, so you think, well, maybe in the end, you know, we get the government that we, we deserve. Um, there have always been uh, a significant proportion of the population who wishes to impose their will on others. The really puzzling thing, I find, is that there are so many people who seem quite happy with that. Sarah? When I was eight years old, the GP came to my house, my parents' house, and gave my father an injection, and it was terribly politically incorrect these days, but afterwards, when he was going, he handed me the needle and syringe, and I spent the next few years practicing injecting my teddy bear with Ribena. And uh, I used to get wheeled out by my parents, who were terribly proud of me, about the fact that you know, I had decided at the age of eight that I wanted to be a GP. And whenever people said to me, and what do you want to do when you become a GP? And my answer was always, I want to make people better. Apparently, that's not what I do. Apparently, I suffer from an extreme form of self-righteousness. I routinely and regularly manipulate and misrepresent science and statistics, and I have a nifty little sideline in persecution. Well, perhaps I do. But actually, the thing that most surprised me, I think, about uh, Chris's comments was the idea that I have any power as a GP, over what people do at all. God knows I wish I could persuade more of my patients to stop smoking. When it comes down to it, my job is to put, give them the facts they need to make an informed decision. And I think it's really possibly disingenuous on Chris's part to suggest that we are going to go exactly the same way with respect to alcohol and with food as we have with smoking. Last time I looked, there was no safe level of smoking, and nobody has suggested that there is for about 50 years. I'm a medical advisor for Drink Aware, and at Drink Aware, the alcohol charity, we are very conscious that there is a safe level of alcohol, and that indeed, for some, a relatively small minority, I might add, Chris, and given that it's men over 40, I'm not quite sure if you fall into that category yet, there are some groups who can benefit from moderate drinking. And I am absolutely not going to suggest that it should ever be banned. Indeed, I would be doing myself a disservice. I very much enjoy sitting down to dinner with a glass of wine. But there is a safe level of drinking. Last time I looked, we were highly unlikely to suggest that there was no safe level of eating. All of us need food, but all of these things have problems. If we look at the size of the issue that we've got with smoking, yes, we have made a difference, and I'm very proud of the fact that as a GP, I've worked with some of my patients, not hugely successfully. The success rates for stopping smoking are pretty, pretty jolly poor, even so. But we have more than halved the number of people who smoke in this country in 1974, it was 45%. In 2010, it was 20%. Tragically, the number of women who smoke has dropped far less than the number of men, down from 51 to 20% in the case of men, down from 41 to 20% in the case of women. Why? Because women don't want to be fat. So the arguments of the smoking lobby have changed. It's not smoking is good for your health. We used to have medicinal cigarettes, and apparently boys at Eton in the 18th, 19th century used to be beaten if they did not have their medicinal tobacco. We have moved a long way since then, but I have to say I have an awful lot of teenage female patients who smoke because, as far as they're concerned, they are clearly going to live forever, and this is going to mean they're going to live forever skinny. So let's have a think about the statistics from smoking. You and I pay our taxes, and I have to say whenever I go onto Radio 5 or Radio 2 in particular and do phone-ins, there are very much two ends of the spectrum. At one end, there's the, I pay my taxes, I pay more in taxes in cigarettes than I'm ever going to claim from the NHS, except that, of course, they usually buy them from abroad when they go over on a booze run. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have the hang them and flog them, leave them on the roadside, clutching their chest from a heart attack if they're overweight because it's clearly their fault. It's political correctness gone mad. Despite all the efforts that we've made, we reckon that one and a half million hospital admissions in the UK are due to smoking-related disease, and we have a huge problem in the NHS budget. We do not have enough money to meet the problems that we have coming forward. Alcohol, likewise, accounts for an enormous number of admissions. We know that about 2,000, 2 billion pounds, indeed 2,000 million pounds, alcohol-related hospital admissions in one year alone. That is an awful lot of money. And no, it's not the binge drinkers. Actually, 
13 times more people in the 50 to 75 year age group get admitted to hospital with alcohol related problems than the 16 to 24 year olds that we hear so much about. And most of those problem drinkers are sitting at home in their middle class sitting rooms having themselves two gin and tonics and sharing a bottle of wine or two with their partners. They have absolutely no idea that they are drinking to excess and potentially doing themselves harm. Let's look then at eating, because we do have a huge problem there. I'm not for a second suggesting we should ban eating. I enjoy a good dinner along with the best of them. But to put it into perspective, again, let's look at diabetes. We know that obesity is absolutely the single biggest risk factor for diabetes. If you double your, the levels of obesity in a country, you will double the number of people who have it. We've gone from 1940, where 200,000 people had diabetes, to 1960, 20 years later, doubled to 400,000. 1980, 20 years after that, doubled to 800,000. It was still a bit of a minority sport, about 1.2% of the population. That was when I became a medical student. Those of you doing the maths, I did become a doctor when I was six. By 2000, we'd reached about 1.6 million. We doubled it again. Ten years later, we've doubled it again. We haven't doubled it in 20 years. We've doubled it in 10. 10% 10 of the NHS budget today is spent on treating diabetes. Ten years ago, it was 5%. We doubled the proportion of an ever-growing NHS budget that we spend. So what are we going to do? Are we going to stop giving people advice as doctors about things that are good for them? Rosie Prescott, the chief executive of the Central YMCA, was part of a, a commission which published something called Reflections on Body Image. Her view was that we should stop telling people, that we should make the term obese on a par with racial abuse. We should make it a criminal offence. And her view was, if people do not feel overweight and there are no health indications, no one, not even their doctor, should tell them. Well, Rosie Prescott, I'm afraid there are health implications for being overweight. There are health implications for being obese. It is not my right as a doctor to tell my patients that. It's my duty. Thank you. Michael. Our kids are too fat. They're hyped up. And according to Michael Gove, they're failing to do as well as their European counterparts at school. Now, do we need to do something? And I come from the School Food Trust, the Children's Food Trust. So the question that I want to pose is, can school food help? In 1980, Margaret Thatcher deregulated school food. In the next 20 years, it went from something like 70% of parents who were happy for their kids to have a meal at school every day, a hot dinner, to only just over 40%. And the food on offer became increasingly high in fat and sugar and salt, all of the things that the Department of Health was telling us was storing up big problems for the future. Overweight and obesity soared from just a few percent to over 15% within 20 years, and by last year, a quarter of our five-year-olds and a third of our 11-year-olds were either overweight or obese. And we have lots of evidence that that tracks into adulthood where people continue to get heavier and heavier. In 2001, the government introduced guidelines for school food that said caterers had, at the very least, to offer healthy options at lunchtime. But these had absolutely no impact on what kids had to eat at school. So after Jamie Oliver pointed out that, quote, we were killing our kids with the food we were serving them at school, the Department for Education said, eh, maybe we should do something about this, and introduced compulsory standards for all the food that was provided at school throughout the day. So no more chips every day, but you can have them twice a week, or turkey Twizzlers and burgers every day, but you can have them twice a week. And no more sweets and crisps and soft drinks. You can't have those at all because you don't need to have them at school. There'll be other opportunities when you can buy them. After all, what's the point of telling kids in the classroom about healthy eating and then offering them the exact opposite at lunchtime? And if you say they should learn to choose the healthy options, well, we know from the 2001 guidelines that that just doesn't work. Do we need tight controls? You bet we do. Kids are not just little adults with the same decision-making powers. And there's a great ad for sweets on television at the moment, which has little kids sitting down in front of a plate with one sweet on it. And they're told that if they wait five minutes, they can have two sweets. And what do they do? 
Well, they hem and haw for a bit, and it's all very cute, and then they eat the one sweet on the plate. So they don't have the executive function that helps them to make decision-making that one would like adults to have, but we know from experience even adults don't have. If we want our kids to grow up healthy and smart, they need our support. That's what parents are for. And schools operate in loco parentis. They have a duty of care to look after kids at school, and that includes the food that they eat. So if the guidelines for healthy eating published by the Department of Health mean anything, they should make sure that the catering in school reflects the best for our kids. And has the compulsory school food legislation made a difference? Yes, it has. We have clear, objective evidence on three things. And it's evidence where the statistics stand up. This isn't something I'm making up. First, the legislation means that kids who have food at school now eat far more fruit and veg, for example, and less fat and sugar and salt than they did five years ago. And it's way better than what the kids who bring in a packed lunch or go off site for lunch are having. And we couldn't have done that without the compulsory legislation. Second, we've shown in two separate randomized controlled trials that when kids at both primary and secondary schools eat a healthy meal in a nice dining environment, they actually concentrate in the classroom better after lunch. And they pay more attention to their teachers. And this isn't just the teacher saying, oh yeah, it's much better now that we've introduced healthy food. These are objective measures worked up with the Institute of Education with observers sitting in the corner watching children's behavior. So good food supports better learning. And finally, we have some preliminary findings to show that over a period of one year, as more kids in a school eat the school lunch provided, they're less likely to be overweight or obese. And some work in Newcastle, contrary to what Rob says in his article, shows that the impact of what kids have at school extends across the whole day. They don't go wild and go out and eat a load more junk outside of school just because they've had healthier food at school. And do they like school food? Yes. You hear about all the complaints. But the number of kids eating a school lunch has gone up since 2008-9, from 37% to 46% in primaries, and from 35 to 40% in secondaries. So while the food may not be perfect, it's a whole lot better than it was. And over a quarter of a million kids have started eating healthier school lunches in just the last three years. So that's a vote of confidence from parents and kids in the legislation. And of course, reflects all the hard work that the caterers have put in to make the food not only healthier, but also something the kids want to eat. So we've made great progress in changing what kids eat at school. We've shown that this benefits their health, their growth, and their learning. And if academies, for example, really do want to do the best for their kids, they should be following the standards anyway. But we've already seen some cracks in the wall with sweets and confectionery and soft drinks finding their way back into well over half of secondary academies. The standards are not too hard, as we see loads of schools meeting them and more and more kids eating healthier food. So this isn't some moral or ideological campaign about control freakery or freedom of choice. It's one based on evidence. Voluntary guidance does not work. Compulsory legislation does. So my question to Mr. Gove is, why ignore all the evidence if you want kids in England to do better at school? Why not build on the investment of the last five years? Why throw that away? Christine. Great, thanks very much. Um, I'm not an expert on prohibition or smoking or obesity, but I do work um, in the alcohol industry and I can talk about policy debates that go on um, around alcohol. And in my view, um, the short answer to the question we're debating around alcohol today is um, that yes, there is a palpable sense that it's becoming less acceptable than before to drink. Um, and I'm getting involved in today's debate because as you know, I work for SAB Miller and we're a beer company and as a result I have to go to a lot of debates on alcohol which involve the government, the public health community, doctors, NGOs and academics. 
So I'll contribute by giving you a perspective from some recent experiences, um, namely fringe events focusing on alcohol abuse at the Labour and Tory party conferences. In the three debates I attended in Manchester and Birmingham, I heard a lot about the negative side of alcohol and very little about the positive. Yet drinking alcohol is not predominantly about antisocial behaviour, alcoholics and city centres blighted by drunken revellers. For most people, it is about socialising, friendship, food, family and fun. And I think in today's world, we don't say enough about alcohol being part of social happy times, such as birthdays, Christmas, weddings, a regular meal with friends, a good night out over the weekend, an afternoon at Wimbledon with a pims in hand or drinking a beer at the sports club after a game of tennis or cricket. But there's plenty said about affluent middle-class drinkers who drink too much at home, underage and binge drinkers, and increases in alcohol hospital um, admissions. And I think one of the classic examples, one that I found quite strange, um, one of the worst examples of what I see as this prohibition by stealth is one that's actually very close to home. As I said, you know, I work for an alcohol company, and at last year's Christmas lunch in our canteen, there wasn't a beer or a glass of champagne in sight. And we did wonder what that was all about, considering we work for an alcohol company, but we couldn't have a Peroni with our Christmas lunch. So um, I think that that is an example of, of prohibition by stealth, um, how it's even creeping into the corporate world and being worried about giving the wrong impression about alcohol. Another example, um, I sometimes find myself dreading having to speak or participate at meetings or seminars because of the perceived unacceptability of alcohol and the alcohol industry. I've had experiences of being reduced to a quivering wreck when I have to introduce myself and I'm thereafter referred in rather aggressive terms as the industry, not Christine or our colleague from SAB Miller, just the industry, as in what does the industry have to say about that? And I can tell you it's not a very pleasant experience being on, on the end of that. Um, and just to expand that point around the increasing unacceptability of alcohol or talking about how much you do or don't drink, um, I just wonder how many of you here have had to um, be rather economical with the truth when the doctors asked you how many units of alcohol you've drunk and have possibly not been quite as honest as you might be for fear of thinking I may be classified a binge drinker. I don't want to be flippant about alcohol abuse because I want to make it clear that I'm not dismissing or underestimating the serious nature of it. I think we all know, as reasonable, rational adults, the consequences of drinking too much. So I want to move on to a serious question. Is there justification for this concern around drinking and how much we consume as a society? And I'm possibly being a bit, sympathetic, a, a bit um, simplistic, but there are, very, there are two schools of thought around this. Um, both are worth considering because they just aren't simple answers to an issue as complex as alcohol abuse. The first school of thought is the one that I subscribe to, um, professionally, obviously, and personally as well. And this school of thought argues that the trends in the UK regarding alcohol consumption, regarding alcohol consumption are good and going in the right direction. 78% of people do drink within the recommended guidelines. Alcohol consumption peaked around 2004, 2005 and has been steadily decreasing since. And there is much less underage drinking than there was. So the argument is that it's a small minority who abuse alcohol. The majority of people drink responsibly. And the answer to problem drinkers is to target them with specific interventions and not implement blanket responses which affect everyone. I personally don't believe more laws are needed. Alcohol is already one of the most regulated products in the world. What we do need is adherence to the strict standards of commercial behavior, which prohibits companies such as ourselves from marketing our products to under 18s or linking alcohol with sexual or sporting success. I think we need better enforcement of existing laws to ensure that alcohol is not sold to drunk or underage drinkers. And I think good consumer education programs such as those run by the Drink Aware Trust are very effective. And ultimately, what we should be looking at doing is providing information that helps people understand how much they are drinking so they can regulate themselves. The other school of thought is that the increased focus on the problems of drinking is justified because alcohol related hospital admissions are up as a result of years of increased consumption. They are increasing costs to the NHS, and I, I believe the figures that we work with are that it's 2.7 billion, which, which is a very high number, and it's not something that we should take lightly. And obviously there's the issue of antisocial behavior. 
So the argument on this side of the debate goes that the overall solution is to reduce the amount of alcohol consumed by everyone, raising the price of a drink, making alcohol less available, and restricting the way alcohol producers can market their products. I personally don't like the second because for me it results in a negative interpretation of alcohol and it has the potential to result in less choice, higher prices, more regulation. In short, increased nannying and ultimately less personal and commercial freedom. To my mind, this argument assumes too much that we as individuals can't police and control ourselves and lays all the responsibility for behaviour change at the government's door. I'm not comfortable with that. Surely the vast majority of us know when we've had enough and can say, thanks, I'm finished, that's me done for the night. And sometimes we don't and we live to regret it the next day. But I think as adults, we have to take personal responsibility for that. And I think most people do. Um, so I guess in terms of, of the debate today, the question we need to ask ourselves regarding um, alcohol and that's my area, I guess. What argument is most comfortable for you? Taking responsibility for your own drinking or relying on the government to control what we drink and encouraging more regulation? And I just want to close on a positive note because I did attend a conference on Thursday and there was um, a rather delightful Italian doctor who was on one of the panels and he finished his talk and I thought I just might crib that for today which, where he said, think of alcohol as a pleasure which it can be when drunk in moderation. I thought the smoking ban, the public smoking ban uh, in Scotland in 2006, England in 2007, I think that was a real watershed moment um, because I think for two reasons. Per first of all, because the kind of accidental way in which, the semi-accidental way in which the the lobbyists kind of got a, a complete ban when, yeah, they didn't think that wasn't what was in the election manifesto, etc. But also the fact that actually authorities uh, have not met the resistance they expected to it. I, I, I would be very surprised if uh, there wasn't a little bit of trembling about what kind of reaction there would be, passive resistance to it and all that. And actually people have gone along with it, you know, pretty much universally. Um, uh, and so you've seen the smoking bans implemented worldwide now, and not just in enclosed public spaces where the slightly dubious evidence around passive smoking might at least have some kind of uh, purchase, but even in completely open areas now in New York, that, that uh, a ban on smoking in open areas is now, uh, has now been implemented. Um, and I think it, this, this is something that cuts across the party political divide. I mean, in Britain, New Labour was the was the party that really got this, the ball rolling in terms of, the, uh, of, of these things. But the coalition government, uh, after a sort of brief hiatus, has, has shown just as much enthusiasm for doing these kinds of things as New Labour, if not more. And north of the border, the Scottish National Party are, really are the, most, the biggest nanny staters of, of all. I mean, they are, are always at the forefront of every kind of new uh, policy initiative to kind of restrict uh, what, we, what we do or make it more expensive and so on. Now, I think there is a lot of moralism being dressed up as health protection here. Now, that's not to say that I don't understand the, uh, appreciate the, 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 uh, the situation of the individual member of the medical profession, you know, perhaps frustrated at the, the fact that, you know, someone with chronic bronchitis won't give up smoking or, you know, someone who's obviously got liver problems is, like, continuing to drink. Um, I can well understand you know, they, would, they would like to try and change people's behaviour, and that, that's something that's always been a part and parcel of the kind of GP-patient um, relationship. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot of interference going on in that relationship now, and there's a wider problem going on as well. Um, I think there's a, new, there's a new factor, and I think it's the, 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 the idea that um, we're being sold now is that ordinary people are, are vulnerable and weak and can't really be trusted to make these decisions themselves, and actually those decisions kind of need to be taken out of their hands. And these, basically, ordinary people need to be protected from three things. One to evil corporations, of which Christine is a, is a personification here, um, uh, from, uh, from our own dangerous impulses, the, the fact that we can't control ourselves once we get a whiff of nicotine or alcohol, um, and also from other people as well. So in terms of evil corporations, you know, there's this idea that they sell us these, you know, through seductive advertising, uh, particularly directed at children, um, we should, you know, they, they can you know, persuade us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise want to do. Um, and uh, so in 2007 in the UK, um, we have a, a introduction of an advertising ban on food, food that was high in fat, salt or sugar in children's programmes or in pr programmes that children predominantly watch. 
Um, the SNP and, and latterly uh, various medical bodies would like to see that ban extended to the nine o'clock watershed for all programmes. So basically it's kind of lumping ordinary everyday food in with sex and violence and saying that that's just adult material from now on, which seems to me a very peculiar situation. So foods and snacks that we she ate as children didn't apparently do us any harm and now to be quarantined off uh, onto the, into late night programming. Um, in addition, we're all, uh, from the point of view of ourselves, we're, we're all deemed to be kind of potential addicts in one way or other, victims of our own biology. I mean, that's always been the, the way in which it's been presented in terms of cigarettes, that, you know, you have a whiff of nicotine and then you, you, you won't be able to control yourself. Um, and that's the reason people don't give up. Um, but as Newsnight, sh Newsnight showed last uh, Monday, uh, that's, it's becoming a very mainstream argument now that actually fat and sugar are addictive as well as well on the slightly spurious evidence that if you look at a brain scan of somebody who's taken cocaine and look at a brain scan of somebody who's having some nice food, then they, uh, they, sit, they, sit, they look superficially the same. Well, obviously, you know, pe people are experiencing pleasure. You know, there's a neurological kind of reflection of that. But you know, that doesn't mean that you know, fat and sugar are addictive. You know, or, 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 you know, in fact, I, I would argue that, that hard, hard drugs, you know, I think the addiction notion is, is, is a very dubious one. But certainly... Um, the idea of lumping fat and sugar in with, um, with, with hard drugs seems to me absolutely ridiculous. And finally, there's other people. So um, there's this idea that if pe other people are smoking, drinking or eating the wrong food, then that we will regard that behaviour as normal. And therefore, what we need to do is go out and denormalise these behaviours, whether it's uh, particularly with, with smoking. There's a lot of campaigns around that now. That's a justification for the New York open air ban. It's a justification for advertising around parents smoking, like you're going to lead to your child smoking as well. Um, I think the complete opposite is the case that most parents who smoke get harangued constantly by their children about their smoking. Um, but I think there's also something else going on here. There's a political factor. Um, so uh, alongside our own personal weakness, and it's... Um, that, that idea that's been sold to us, um, uh, which you know, fits in with what Chris Snowden said about um, you know, people not uh, railing against these ideas. Actually, I think to some extent they've internalised them and accepted the idea that they're too weak to do these, uh, to control their behaviour themselves. But there's a political factor here as well, and I think this is very, very important that you know, at a time when politicians have found you know, that their traditional role in life and the traditional role of the state has been undermined, um, so the idea that you could control the economy or, or, or manage how society works um, is very much seen as not possible now. And that's not even just from the recession, that's from the, the, first, the first thing the new Labour government did as soon as it came into power was hand over power, of in, power over interest rates to the Bank of England. So it's even saying... We, you know, we can't be trusted with the economy. Well, what is the state for and what is the political class for? Um, and uh, so I think that they've, what they've done is they've, they've, they've uh, taken, that, taken on the role of being our grand protectors. I mean, though it's obvious in relation to crime, but now it's, it's seeping into every sort of aspect of government policy, the idea that we need to be protected from you know, you know, big business, we need to be protected from ourselves, and we need to be protected from the behaviour of other people as well. Um, and I think that that's, that's a very, very dangerous um, co conception. I think what we need to do is make a robust defence of our right to make choices. Uh, yeah, an, an assumption that uh, we are capable of making those choices and that it's right for us even to make the, what are supposedly the wrong choices. Yeah, I think it's asserting that uh, autonomy would be far, far healthier than accepting some of these restrictions on our lifestyles. So I'm going to come out to you and uh, we'll have as many uh, of your points and questions as uh, possible. Can I ju just declare an interest as a, as a former member of Parliament and as a former member of the Scottish Parliament, can I just say thank God for Dr Nelson and Dr Jarvis? Uh, and I think my question is what more can government do to actually help you in public health education? I think one of the proudest things I've ever done in Parliament, and, I'm very, and I must say I'm ashamed of a lot of things, but one of the things I'm proud of, proudest of, was the smoking ban in Scotland. It was a great achievement, even within the party that I was then a member of, not now. So it, it was a great achievement in terms of public health. I achieved a lot in terms of secondary, secondary smoking. Sorry, can I just complete my question uninterrupted? I think that would be polite. Well, well, don't, sure, please don't repeat the entire thing. Okay. Don't, just, I'm, not, I'm not going to. What I think is the, the crucial thing here is, is what more we can do to actually help uh, the doctors in the front line, like the GPs. One of the most valuable things I ever did as, uh, as a member of Parliament was actually spend a day at GPs practice with specialist nurses specialising in 
di diabetes and helping diabetics uh, control their diets so they weren't admitted to hospital. I think there's a lot more that can be done through specialist nurses. GPs obviously are, are highly pressurized. The specialist nurses can give patients more time. We need more public health education. That's what's clear, that, that's what's absolutely necessary and what we should do. And by the way, I also support Mayor Bloomberg in New York in what he's doing. I think it's great. Conscious of what Christine said about dehumanizing people from various sectors, I, I won't address my uh, comments to the health industry. I'll, I'll address them to Michael and Sarah. Uh, uh, on Sarah's point, it worries me a lot, although I can understand it from a medical professional, that a lot of the arguments about control and state intervention seem to be based around the cost then faced by the National Health Service. I think that raises a lot of questions about how we organize the National Health Service in Britain. I mean, I, for one, as a heavy smoker, would be more than happy to waive any right I have to treatment for smoking-related diseases on the National Health Service in return for being able to source my cigarettes at cost price, which I think would be about 80 pence. Uh, would you be happy with such arrangements if they could be practically enforced? And I'd like to do the same for alcohol. To Dr Nelson's point about the need for compulsion, why is it the case, if your statistics on food are so overwhelming, that parents aren't agitating for this? I remember when I was at school, the PTA of the local school would be pushing very hard. If there was any suggestion we were going to close down the playing fields, they made a big effort to help actually build an indoor swimming pool because that would help the fitness of children. If it's true that these are the spectacular results that are shown by changing the diet provided to school kids, why is it that the state's needing to do that? Why isn't it that parents are demanding and insisting on it from the schools that they send their children to? I was at the same meeting as Chris Snowden and the impression that I got is that the reason that people aren't taking on board the messages isn't that they haven't heard them and they haven't understood them, it's that they're too stupid to understand the message so they need to be told more and more and more. And I think that's both insulting and by the way this was very much aimed at the lower uh, demographic of society not ni nice middle-aged smokers and drinkers like myself. I was wondering that if anyone on the panel thought that w uh, one of the reasons for, uh, as Rob calls it, a new age of prohibition might be down to, f down to a, um, that people feel like they want to be saved for, uh, from these evils. Like, if anyone on the panel thinks people f think, they know, that they know that they think they're doing something wrong, but they are just waiting for themselves to be saved by the nanny state. My name is Fiona and I work for a tobacco company. I have to say that first out. I've actually got three children. I breastfed three of them. I was pregnant for six years. I home birthed two of them. How politically correct do I have to get? At the moment in uh, Finland, there is legislation on the statute books that they would like to put pregnant women who drink too much into section. They're doing the same thing in Australia. There is research that they would like to do. Women that drink too much should not, should be on contraception so that they don't get pregnant. I, I think it comes to the fundamental question of what is a good life and what is a good society. Now as somebody raising children currently, I think that my preoccupation with them is not to make them live as long as possible or even to be healthy when they're 70 or 80. My preoccupation is to make them critical, independent-minded, non-conformist, and to actually not be obsessed with their bodies. So my question to the panel is, is Felix Baumgartner a good or a bad role model for children? He took a massive risk and a known risk with his health. What would the health professionals have advised him to do? Um, and if he was a father, what would you advise him to do? There, there's a disconnect here that, that I keep hearing. Um, arguments from the, say, libertarian side that we shouldn't be taking these actions and responses from both the panel and the, and the audience on what you might call the public health side that say, if we take these actions, the following good things will happen. I'm not hearing a connection there coming from the, the public health side that says, and therefore the ethical basis for going ahead and doing it in spite of <clears throat> the arguments from the libertarian side is. Um, so I'd kind of like to hear that. There doesn't seem to be much of a, an ethical debate. Um, 
about whether it's right or wrong to, to take a certain intervention if they believe it's going to save lives. I mean, a number of public health meetings I've been at, it's evidence-based policy, but all the evidence needs to say is if we do this, we're pretty sure we think it will save lives. Minimum pricing, for example, will save 900 lives, whatever it is. Therefore, there's no need to discuss any of the unintended consequences, and no need to discuss any of the, the issue, is this right? And fundamentally, no attempt to discuss the key question, which is this actually any of our business? And I feel that Michael and Sarah kind of ducked the issue that we're here to talk about, really. I mean, Sarah's told us about you know, the, 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 the statistics, the diseases and so on, and aren't they awful? Of course they are. Michael's talked about regulation of, of school food, which, you know, yeah, I agree. You know, children should be treated like children. Adults should make those decisions. You know, I don't necessarily disagree with that, even though I think his organisation should be shut down. Um, but that's not really what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about, I think, is, is neo-prohibitionist policies like minimum pricing, like plain packaging, like denying treatment to smokers in hospitals, like outdoor smoking bans, smoking bans in your own home, uh, fat taxes. And this, this, to give you an example, this is from the current issue. I've not cherry-picked this from some lunatic. This is from the, uh, the current issue with the New England Journal of Medicine, the leading article in the magazine this, this week, talking about what new interventions we can, we can do in the next few years. Um, a couple of them here. The federal government could require individuals to pay a tax penalty unless they declare that they haven't used tobacco products during the year. Or it could give a tax credit to people who submit documentation that their body mass index is in the normal range. It could tax individuals who fail to p purchase gym memberships. Now this is going, and this isn't even sin taxes, these are just fines. Pure and simple. This is just a, a financial penalty for not living within the the rules uh, that the medical establishment have, have set up. Uh, the public health, I must say, uh, just, I maybe should have said this before, I am not for a minute suggesting that people like Sarah are um, prohibitionists or, or busybodies. The public health movement is very much distinct from the actual frontline medical care, and I've never met a GP who hasn't come across as perfectly sensible and very, um, very realistic about things, and nothing Sarah has said so far has, has changed that. Uh, but public health is a different kettle of fish. There you have people who have very often no medical training whatsoever. You get people from uh, you know, PhDs in management or sociology or mechanical engineering. People basically who in more enlightened times would be just on the streets with a sandwich board ranting and raving and selling pencils from a cup. But thanks to the multi-billion pound public health industry, these people are able to call themselves public health professionals or, or what have you. So let me be very clear where I stand. It is no business of the government whatsoever whether someone gets fat whether someone smokes, whether someone drinks. It is no business of mine, and therefore it is no business of any politician. And that's all there is to it. I absolutely hear what everybody's saying about my rights this and my rights that. The problem I've got is that, yeah, I have put some statistics. Interestingly, one of the only things that Christine and I agreed on when she said £2.7 billion, it was £1.99 billion for alcohol admissions in patients, another £0.6 billion for um, alcohol A&E attendances, doesn't even begin to cover the cost. I'm duty doctor in my practice every Friday afternoon and the same names come up time and time and time again. And it's always the same people who come in and disrupt all my other patients. A patient who came in last Friday wanting more um, benzodiazepines to come off his alcohol yet again and came into the surgery, screamed at everybody, Several people had to leave the surgery. We had to call the police. This is not an extreme example in my practice in Shepherd's Bush. I'm delighted the gentleman at the back would be more than happy not to impose upon the NHS if he were allowed to buy his cigarettes at cost price. Unfortunately, in Shepherd's Bush, in the inner city, largely deprived practice where I work, people are not prepared to do that. They all have rights, and I'm afraid very few of them have responsibilities. We do have an individual cost, and I see that cost every day when I have patients coming in to see me, and they've developed COPD or lung cancer, and they'll say, why didn't you warn me? And I'll look and think, sorry? Were you not in the same 10 consultations I was? We talked about this. They chose not to listen. There are limits to what I can do. But Chris says, it's, no, it's nobody's right. It's everybody's right to eat to excess, to develop diabetes. Well, fine. But £9 billion, the cost of the NHS of treating diabetes today, and it is going up every day. And that means that patients of mine cannot get physiotherapy when they need it. They can't get their cataracts replaced when they need it because all the money is going into treating these conditions. I feel that I owe it to my individual patients to try and help my other patients make decisions which will reduce the burden on the NHS and will reduce the personal burden for them. I'll pick up the point about compulsion. 
Um, your question was, why aren't parents agitating? Okay. Um, the food business sells cereal that is, in some instances, 50% sugar. It sells lots of cereals that turn the milk brown when you pour milk on it. Um, they spend hundreds of millions of pounds every year telling parents what great fun these foods, fun is a good thing, you know, I'm not knocking fun, what fun these foods are. If I had the same budget to tell parents of the benefits of eating healthily for their children, then they would be banging on the school door and saying, I want my children to eat more healthily when they are at school. It's this imbalance, and I think the role of government is to help redress that balance and to protect the rights of children in school particularly. I love, I love the way everybody uses, quote, the nanny state as a pejorative term. Well, who are nannies for but for children? So are you, are you suggesting that we shouldn't be looking after our children as best we possibly can in school? Should we, should we, have, should we have, as Mars, UK, Mars US had, vending machines in primary schools selling chocolate bars to children that they could buy whenever they wanted? Is that the kind of world that you want your children to live in? Yes. Unprotected? Vulnerable? The other point I want to make is that parents, okay, they're not aware of their benefits, but three weeks ago in the so earlier named New England Journal of Medicine, um, there was a study which shows unequivocally 450,000 people in a cohort study followed for over 20 years that drinking sugary soft drinks makes you fat. Now, that did not hit the front page of the Daily Mail. That did not even hit the page six of The Guardian, I don't think. So where is the balance of information that people need in order to be able to make these decisions? Because their world is swamped with information from one perspective and nothing from the other. Um, a couple of comments. Um, someone mentioned the, the point about education, and particularly um, public health e education, and I just want to talk about the Drink Aware Trust, because that um, now most adverts for alcoholic drinks now carry the Drink Aware um, website address, and I know, looking at the latest stats, that 300,000 people a month go to the site, and I think that has contributed to the positive trends we're seeing around drinking. So I think, as I said in my um, remarks, that education is very, very important. And I just want to get back to the point about um, people who do abuse alcohol. I think the point I'm making is that it's not the majority of people who abuse alcohol, but the people who do abuse alcohol, we obviously need to take that very seriously, and it does have costs, and I'm not trying to undermine the problems that are caused by that. The, the Irish government is introducing a, uh, an advertising ban for, for children's programming, um, as we have in the UK. And there's been a big um, rumpus in Ireland about the fact that, because it's high in fat, cheese would be included in this, um, in this advertising ban. Uh, and eventually they came to a settlement with the uh, dairy producers that cheese would be excluded. But they would ha have to in include on screen during the adverts the, the government guidelines about how much cheese you're allowed to eat. So it's kind of this, cr this cross-pollination going on where now the units of alcohol have now been transmogrified into units of cheese that are safe um, for you to consume. <laughs> Absolutely insane as far as I'm concerned. Um, I mean, I, I, going further in my comments about, about, about the GP relationship, I mean, I think most people will find now, because there's so much target setting um, by, the, uh, by the government in terms of, of, of what happens at the GP surgery, that actually there's like another person sitting in the room telling the GP what to say. So I go to my GP and I, you know, I, whatever complaint I go to, I always end up being sent for a cholesterol test. Uh, and being weighed and prodded and whatever and uh, asked about all sorts of things that actually have nothing potentially to do with the condition in hand. And I think that that's really problematic. I do think it's very important 
to restore the proper GP patient relationship that is not interfered with by uh, these, these various um, moralistic campaigns, um, because I think that that's a much better way in which to encourage people to, uh, uh, to, to, to change behavior when it's necessary. I mean, I've lost family, you know, family members to alcoholism. I'm not, you know, blase about it by any stretch of the imagination. But some of these things are complicated. So, so for example, the, Sarah says, diabetes, obesity, it's, it's, it's a straightforward connection. No problem at all. We just got to get people to be skinnier and blah blah blah. So we should have all these food interventions, and it is actually much more complicated than that. So, for example, in the U.S., although, I mean, although there's a connection between obesity and diabetes, in the U.S., roughly 50% 50, 50 of the people who've got type 2 diabetes are not, in fact, obese. They are overweight or of normal weight. So it's just more complicated than that, and there isn't simplistic solutions to that, and there's also a very significant connection between ethnicity and, and type 2 diabetes as well. I think that's well recognised as well. So it's not as, as simple, perhaps, as Sarah's presenting it. In terms of the, uh, of the advertising budgets, I have to say that while they, they, they may spend hundreds of millions on advertising, then they get, they get something that they would pay even more for, which is like having the, the resident GP on the one show saying how you should, how you should eat or how you should live your lives, because that's just pure credibility, as opposed to Tony the Tiger or whatever, which is just like fun. Um, and it's the sa same in schools. I mean, the, the school curriculum has, is now dominated by stuff about the environment and healthy living. Um, so that's, that's everywhere now. That's just, like, that's just like the entire kind of like background to the way kids are, are growing up. So... Um, you know, that, that's, 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 um, that's publicity that um, you know, these big uh, food companies just couldn't buy. Just listening to this, uh, three quick observations, I suppose. Um, one, that chocolate bars don't kill. Um, and if parents want their children to eat fewer chocolate bars, uh, they can give them uh, less um, pocket money to spend on them. Or, or, or they can tell them it's a bad thing. Um, I spent my pocket money on cigarettes, as it, ha as it happened, and it didn't go on the chocolate bars. So, you know... You, People make decisions, and sometimes parents make decisions for their children. Secondly, when we worry that people can't make decisions because of information overload, we're effectively making an argument to arrogate uh, a decision-making making right on their behalf. Somebody better informed is taking uh, the decision for them. And thirdly, to develop a point that uh, Chris, Chris was making, if we want to live in a democracy, people have to self-govern and self-determine. If we start to see, as I think, Sarah, your, your logic entails, we start to see people as an unacceptable cost to the state. I mean, there are, there are ways to deal with that. We could have fewer people rather than just fewer people with diabetes. We could, we could go cut straight to the heart of the problem uh, and have less of them. But when you start to see all of us and everybody else as a unit of cost to be measured to the state, I mean, you can call that government, but you certainly can't call it a democracy. Because if a democracy, by, of its very nature, is made up of self-governing people. Democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. And if we want to stay in a democracy, you have to let people to decide how to govern their own lives. I think part of the problem with regard to obesity, if you like, is that uh, people don't know how to cook. That would help if people could actually cook and they knew what they were eating. I mean, I, I would blame it basically at the door of a big supermarket or the failure of basically the education system which has our children for any number of years for quite a number of hours the day for however many weeks to say as happened to me when I was in school it was like right put together a, a, a nutritional meal I think if you asked quite a lot of adults these days they wouldn't know how to do it for themselves let alone for the children so I do have a sympathy that there is a point in education to teach our children actually to be able to feed themselves not expect Tesco or Waitrose or Lidl or whoever to do it. Um, what another thing is with regard to cheap food, when you look at Safeway's own um, burgers as opposed to bird's eye, the fat and sugar and nasty content um, in the cheap one is, is uh, quite markedly higher. People don't necessarily know those things, but when people have got to the point that there are things that they do know, then I think you've just got to accept that they know those things. Find out what is known and what isn't known and work on the, letting people know the ones that they need to know and being quiet about, Can if you don't mind, the ones that we already have, have, have gathered to be the case. Um, I think to me it's not about 
um, you know, a smoke-free or fat-free world of living. To me, it's about a balanced lifestyle. It's when you, personally, I smoke two to five cigarettes a day and I drink coffee uh, on most days, but uh, meanwhile, I try to do a lot of other things that try to balance out the toxins that take into my body. You know, I exercise regularly, I cook, I eat raw food, I eat organic organic food. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole balanced lifestyle issue. I think arguments about smoking is so bad for you and the statistics, you know, behind it, um, is, it, it loses um, certain power when because the... the the information is partially presented. You know, there are benefits of it that's unmeasurable, that's not being picked up. I was once talking to a doctor about, you know, smoking, and is there any upside to it? He was saying, you know, there's, it, it's a matter of fact that the toxins will make you more anxious than otherwise. Why a lot of people feel, I'm so stressed, I need to smoke, but it's because the inhaling and the exhaling that comes with it helps to soothe your mind. I I think this is a reflection of healthy alternatives. Just a quick one about um, schools and healthy eating. Um, Michael, you talked about the nanny state and the nanny state being about looking after children. My view is that the, the healthy options at lunchtime, that campaign, it isn't actually about the children, it is about the parents and, and it's about adults. And the reason for that is, I mean, as it happens also, I think that parents and adults do know what healthy eating is. Um, but it's not just about the school dinners in schools. I've got nothing against my kids having a healthy um, dinner at school. That's great, thanks. But then it goes far, far beyond that. It's also about packed lunches. So the messages come home to the parents about um, food that the parents choose to put in the lunchbox. My uh, daughter had her Harvest Festival assembly at school this week where, um, when I was a kid, we used to take our tins in and then have um, an assembly about how we should be thankful to the land for providing the food that we eat. Not so these days. It's all about healthy eating. And my daughter had to recite something about carbohydrates and fats and all sorts of things. She learned that. It's about the homework in design and IT. They have to design posters around healthy eating and cooking club where they should be learning how to cook. They are actually, again, they're learning about healthy eating. So, so my view is that the, the campaign doesn't just stop there. It is way beyond that. And it is about the parents and not about the children. Okay, I'll make one simple point. Um, moral business bodies are always looking for a reason to, to interfere and make your business their own. At the moment, as you gather from some of these comments, the most popular way of doing that is by saying it's costing the NHS, therefore it's a negative externality and you're robbing me and it's not fair and we, we're very worried about efficiency. The fact of the matter is, although it's quite distasteful to discuss it, <clears throat> is that smokers and the obese save the government money in the long term. Anybody who dies before their time saves the government money. It's a simple fact. It's been shown study after study. There are more externalities to do with alcohol because of the public order issue, but still on balance, um, the, 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 there is a net gain, I think, to, to the Treasury. But without a shadow of a doubt, uh, with smoking and uh, drinking, you need to do a simple thought experiment. You know, does it cost the state more for somebody to live to, to 70 or 90? All the you're a drain on the society, as I might say, after the age of 65. The government, from an efficiency point of view, would rather you drop dead at the age of a uh, retirement party, basically. And, and that's simply a fact. And when you say that, people say, well, how, how, how cold and calculated to measure life in those terms. But that's exactly what they're doing when they're saying that, oh, it's costing X, Y, and Z to the NHS. I don't believe it's a real uh, reason, actually. I think it's just uh, another excuse. Chris, is an argument I've heard before, and indeed one... Quite possibly, I've used myself when the National Institute for Cutting Expenditure, otherwise known as Neo-Fascists Ignoring Clinical Experience, came out with its guidance on statins and suggested that nobody over the age of 75 should get statins regardless of how high their risk of a heart attack was. My response was, well, that's clearly because the government wants to keep them alive until 75 because we're all going to have to work till then, and then it doesn't want to keep them alive after that because it doesn't want to save lives just in time for the next administration to take all the credit. So you're 
absolutely right. It may well save, save money for the government in the long term. But actually, I'm a GP. I've been accused of looking at numbers and looking at statistics rather than people. You come and spend a day in my surgery in inner city Shepherd's Bush, which is where I've been every day of my working life for the last 23 years. And I can tell you, my job is not about statistics. It is about individual people. I don't want to save I don't want to save the government money. I want to save my patients' lives and their quality of life. I think this is about social justice. I think this is about whether we want a society that cares how people age, and starting from school but working your way through adulthood, whether collectively we want people to have better lives, or whether we're saying individually people can fuck up and ruin their lives, and we collectively don't care. It's not a matter of how much it costs the NHS, although that's partly it, because that is a burden that we all share and that we all have to pay. It's to do with how people are able to interact with one another. So coming back to the point that somebody made about um, parents know what healthy eating is. Well, they do, but they're worse at applying lessons around healthy eating in terms of what they put into their kids' lunch boxes than they are in relation to themselves. So we need consistency of messages. If parents are putting healthy food into the lunch boxes, if IT is getting kids to make healthy menus, if children are learning to cook in a healthy way by using healthier recipes, that to me is fantastic. Um, I'll keep my uh, remarks very short. From, from my perspective, I think it's really just um, a plea for sensible moderation and recognition that a balanced lifestyle is probably the best way to go. And um, we do need to take into account that there is a sense of self-responsibility and personal accountability. And if we bear those principles in mind, I think a lot of this moral panic would not be necessary. Uh, well, I th I, I'm glad that we fi we're finally getting to the sort of philosophical uh, issues at the heart of this. It's a, it is about how you live your life, and I suppose that you could call that a question of social justice or ethical justice, that being allowed the freedom to make your own mistakes uh, and to, to live freely um, and uh, you know, enjoy the things that you enjoy if you want to enjoy them. Um, and you know, understanding that, you know, you know smoke, no, I don't think anybody's under any misapprehension that smoking or drinking um, is, is in any way sort of good for you um, if you do it to a, a, you know, enjoyable excess. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's, that's a choice that we should be made. We should be treated as autonomous beings that can actually make those choices. Um, finally, because nobody else answered it, the Felix Baumgartner uh, question over here. Uh, the answer is he wouldn't have been able to make the jump in the first place because the public health lobby would have banned sugary drink sponsors. <laughs> okay, can we thank all of our panel?